So the agenda here is that we'll have uh, three different talks uh, by each of us. Here on the end, Zayed Kuhar from Lebanon will share his experience. Then I'll go next. So I'm Rob Noecker from the U.S. outside of New York. And then Mark Toteberg. So first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out um, for the next hour. I think you'll find this entertaining and educational. And we'll kick it off. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction. I'm going to talk briefly about the Micropulse technology and give you a clinical uh, summary of the data that is already available. Those are uh, my financial disclosure. So first of all, when it comes to glaucoma treatment, we had uh, a wide range of therapeutic options. And I put them here on a continuum because we usually start off with glaucoma meds, plus or minus SLT in early glaucomas before moving forward to uh, glaucoma surgery or even cyclodestructive procedure in more advanced and refractory uh, cases. Uh, but before picking a therapeutic option, one should keep in mind that the goal of glaucoma treatment is not the intraocular pressure. It's not about a number. It's about the quality of life uh, of your patient and this aspect of glaucoma care, the safety profile of any therapeutic option has been increasingly important during the last uh, decade or, uh, or, or so. So for, first of all, uh, a couple of words on uh, glaucoma surgery. The current standard of care, the current gold standard is uh, trabeculectomy. If you look at this figure here that was published in ophthalmology a couple of years ago, this is from Ramulu's team at Johns Hopkins. Uh, in the vertical axis, you have the total number of procedures performed in the US during the last two decades of, or, or so. And those are basically the total number of glaucoma procedures performed in the US during the last 20 years. And if you subtract uh, the laser procedures, you're basically left out here with glaucoma surgeries. And as you can see, glaucoma surgeries have been stagnating uh, during the last two decades. This is because many ophthalmologists have been shifting away from glaucoma surgery because of the safety profile, because of the necessity of a very intensive follow-up. And this is also why glaucoma surgery is shifting towards the era of minimally invasive surgeries like other areas in medicine. Having said that, cyclodestructive procedures have always been kept for end-stage glaucomas, refractory cases, because the current gold standard, which is the classical diode, the continuous wave diode, has been associated with so many complications that can be side-threatening, like chronic inflammation, hypotony, phthisis, or even sympathetic ophthalmia. And if you look at this figure that is taken from the same paper in ophthalmology, those are the total number of cyclodestructive procedures performed in the US during the last 20 years or so. And you have the impression that the numbers are increasing. Well, this is only because of the introduction of endo cyclophotogravulation. But if you look at the numbers of transcleral treatments, they have been steadily uh, decreasing because of this uh, safety profile. So in 2015, a new technology was FDA approved, which is the micropulse uh, technology for cyclophotogravulation. So basically what they did is that they took the continuous wave diode, the classical diode, and they turned it into a micropulse. If you look here to the left at the continuous wave diode, when you set up your parameters, let's say to 2,000 milliwatts energy in two seconds, when you hit the pedal, the energy goes up and the laser stays on for two seconds, then it goes off. But if you look at to the right here, the micropulse, they basically chopped off the energy to micropulses, to small bursts that are separated by fractions of seconds. So when you hit your pedal here, the laser goes on and off, on and off. And this is a video that illustrates what's happened with this micropulse technology. So to the left, with the classical diode, you have therm thermal built up, energy built up. So you have more pain, more inflammation, more side effects. With the micropulse, there is no thermal built up. So you have less pain and less inflammation and less tissue uh, disruption. And this has been shown in UBM uh, studies. As you can see here, this is pre and post classical diode. And you have evidence of tissue damage, tissue destruction. And this is not uh, the case with the micropulse diode. And this has also been dem demonstrated by Robert Noecker here in histopathological studies on human uh, cadaveric eyes. 
So how does this micropulse work? We know that cyclodestructive procedures work on the inflow of, of aqueous humor, but laser cyclophotocoagulation also works on the outflow, on the uveoscleral outflow by enhancing the supracoroidal space and increasing the permeability of uh, the ciliary body. But recent researches at the University of Washington have shown that it also increases uh, the uh, trabecular outflow. If you see here, this is the ciliary body, and when you hit it with a micropulse, watch closely this area, it contracts and it pulls on uh, the scleral spur that is rotated uh, posteriorly and inward, which enhances uh, the, uh, the, uh, the structure of the Schlems canal, and this might increase also the trabecular outflow. When it comes to the treatment technique, the treatment technique with this micropulse technology is quite simple. So with the classical diode here uh, to the left, we used to have a G-probe and we used to place separated impacts at the level of the limbus. But with this new micropulse, we have what they call an MP3 probe. And instead of placing impacts, we just paint the limbus with a sweeping movement back and forth. And this is uh, an example here uh, by Robert Nowaker showing the modality of treatment. So the technique is quite simple. You just paint the limbus back and forth with your uh, probe until you reach the, uh, the final uh, treatment time. So now that I talked briefly about the technology and about the treatment uh, technique, what's the data supporting the use of micropulse uh, in the treatment of glaucoma? This is a comparative study with, with two arms, a micropulse arm and a continuous wave arm. As you can see here, uh, uh, there were significantly less complications with uh, the micropulse. Furthermore, there was less pain in the post-operative settings. 100% of the micropulse patient had zero pain uh, in the post-op setting. And this is something we also experience in our clinical practice. So those are the results of the early trials that were performed by Paul Chu's team in Singapore. They developed this technology. As you can see here, they started off with really bad refractory glaucomas. The average uh, baseline IOP was around 40 millimeters of mercury in uh, their cohort. And after micropulse treatment, they managed to have a 30% decrease of intraocular pressure with uh, an important reduction in the number of glaucoma meds. And then they moved forward to the early US trial with milder form of glaucomas. As you can see, the baseline average IOP was around 25 millimeters of mercury, and they also uh, obtained uh, a good reduction of intraocular pressure with micropulse with a significant reduction in the number of glaucoma meds. And those outcomes have also been reported by other teams in the literature with a reduction of IOP that, were, with, that was somewhere between the 30 and 40 percent with a reduction of uh, intraocular pressure. But when it comes to uh, glaucoma, uh, the use of lasers in glaucoma, we always ask ourselves if the results are sustainable o uh, over time. And Paul Chu's team from Singapore presented the seven-year follow-up of the patient they treated in the initial trials, and the results uh, seem quite encouraging. And this poster was uh, presented during the European Glaucoma Society last uh, year. This is uh, the last paper I'm going to present. It was published uh, last month in the Journal of Glaucoma from a team in Texas and Bascom Palmer. And they have, as you can see here, a one-year follow-up. So the average uh, baseline IOP in their population was 27 millimeters of mercury, and they treated 84 eyes with a micropulse. And as you can see here, at one year, the reduction of IOP was on the, uh, in the range of 50%, which is quite impressive. And they also had a significant reduction at one year in the number of glaucoma meds. But if you look closely at their results, they also reported that uh, around 40% of their patient had chronic inflammation and visual acuity decrease, actually more than, than a line in 40%. Well, this is most probably because those eyes were over-treated. Uh, they were delivering approximately 225 joules per treatment session, which is much more than the other papers, uh, and it's approximately double what is actually recommended by, by the company, which is only 100 joule. So putting 
uh, using more aggressive parameter might give you a, smile, uh, a small uh, benefit when it comes to IOP, a small additional be benefit, but that would be probably at the expense of uh, the safety profile. And as we know, uh, the goal of the treatment is not only IOP, but also the safety and the quality of life uh, of the patient. So in conclusion, Micropulse is an interesting uh, technology. It has e excellent safety uh, and efficacy profiles. It's a repeatable procedure, so it allows you to keep your options uh, open, and more studies are needed to determine the ideal treatment parameters. Uh, thank you for your attention. So I'm just going to continue on that same theme and share a little bit of uh, data from my own practice. Here's my financial disclosure. I'm a consultant to um, Iridex and help them with some of the early development of Micropulse technology. Just to reiterate, this is a cadaver study that we did at Yale. Um, and, and what we were the purpose of doing this study was we wanted to see um, how much, if this, the effect from the laser was thermal or much as we get with traditional cyclophotocoagulation, or is it different? And so we used three different treatment groups. We can see the top two um, are just different magnifications. A and E are normal, basically normal ciliary body where the treatment is done. The next row is where we did low energy. Because one of the theories, if, if you apply less energy for over a longer period of time with traditional scleral, which I think is a better way to go, so maybe one second uh, or one milliwatt uh, duration, one watt for about five seconds is different than applying 2.5 watts for two seconds. Um, it's probably better to do it longer and slower. So this is with the slow burn. Then we have the micropulse um, there. And then after that, we have the traditional kind of short duration, high power um, transcleral. And what we see here is well, definitely with the transcleral, where it's purple, it's dead. It's burned up. The tissue is coagulated. It's non-functional. You'll have coagulative necrosis, which leads to chronic inflammation. And this is why we worry a little bit sometimes with transcleral. While it works very low for lowering pressure, can also cause tightness and hypotony. So you don't really want to have this much purple as we do down in the bottom. Versus up here, we still have some changes occurring with the lower energy, long duration. And then with the micropulse, we really don't see any purple coagulative changes in the ciliary processes, just kind of a, an uptake of the energy and maybe some more inflammatory cells there. Um, underneath the surface. So really very little histopathologic change when you do UBMs. I think we have some UBMs looking. You don't see it in live humans either. You don't see morphologic changes. So it seems to be a change in, in the tissue itself. So this is the study that we presented last year at the, at the ASCRS meeting um, in the U.S. and it was for 95 consecutive. We just like, took every patient that we treated with Micropulse and followed them through. My treatment protocol is to start at two watts, especially in darker pigmented eyes, so African Americans or just dark brown eyes, versus you know pseudo exfoliation eyes, bright you know white blue eyed people. We tend to I tend to start at like 2.5 watts. So I think the pigmentation definitely does make a difference, as does age and some other other variables. Um, we use the standard duty cycle of 31.3, and the maximum we ever treated was for three watts, um, typically with retreatments, and then we followed up the patients over time. Demographics, typical glaucoma patient population, about over half for, uh, were Caucasian. Then we had Hispanic and African Americans worked in there. Here's my treatment now, and I don't use a speculum now, which I think is really important. I think it's improved my technique. Um, is not using a speculum, you, number one, you can just see holding the eyelids open. You can make sure that you're posterior, because I think when we talk about complications afterwards, which we will in the round table, complications are most likely to happen, say, with medriasis or a dilated pupil afterwards or inflammation in the anterior segment. It most from some treating in the iris plane, because it's very easy to drift forward. So I find that not having a speculum tends not to push the, the iris, the probe, as anterior, and it basically get a better treatment with less anterior segment inflammation, almost no anterior segment inflammation segment inflammation. So it's a very easy procedure to do without a speculum. Um, and so this is how I do it now versus in the purple globe video. When we look at the IOP reduction in our case series, we see that start up around the average started around 25 millimeters of mercury. On average, we finished in the, in the um, upper teens, around 17.5. We also see a corresponding drop, decrease in eye drops. So, you know, one of the questions is where we use it in the treatment algorithm. We certainly will talk about that. Um, in, in our discussion, but you know, this patient was a little bit more on the tertiary side, so on maximal medical therapy, I would say usually three medications, um, but we, we tended to decrease those down by about two bottles or two drops per person. 
bad things. Um, so pa some patients get dry eye symptoms afterwards. Some people end up a little bit low in the initial week or so. But really, when you look at the, the compared to traditional glaucoma surgery, if you look at any, you know, a tube shunt surgery or trabeculectomy surgery, I will take this list of, uh, of side effects any time compared to traditional glaucoma surgery, especially when you look at long-term hypotony and entysis, chronic inflammation really doesn't happen with this procedure. So that's all I have prepared. And then we'll have Mark Totberg. So thanks for the introduction. Um, these are my financial disclosures. Some are relevant to this talk. You heard before what the difference is between the MP3 treatment and the G-probe. I think the most important thing to keep in mind, it is less heat, it's less inflammation, and it's less pain, and that makes a huge difference when you want to decide on which patient you want to use the MP3. How did I start to do MP3? Well, it's a pretty simple story and kind of boring, but just imagine you have your iPhone, you drop it into water and it's broken, and you have to get a new one. And that's why I like the iPhone. I have to admit I'm an Apple user. I want to have something safe and simple. So I buy a new one, plug it in, and it backups everything. I know glaucoma doesn't work like that always, but if you have something and it's simple and easy and safe, why not treat it? Um, go back to the MP3. Why did I start? My old laser broke. Simple story. I bought a new one, and the Iridex team told me, well, the new one can actually do something more. It can do the G-Pro procedure that I was doing in a couple of my patients for years, but it can also do something else, the MP3. And nearly one and a half years ago, we did the first cases. And when I started to use it, I didn't know much about it. And the literature was pretty, I mean, there was not so much in the literature to know about MP3. I wanted to first know it's non-inferior, because if I want to treat my patient, I want to treat them as good as I was treating them before with the G-Pro procedure. So in the beginning, the first 34 eyes I did, I do one eye MP3, one eye G-probe, just to prove for myself the concept that it's non-inferior. So we included 16 patients, followed them up for six months, and the pressure in the beginning was quite well matched in the both groups, about 29 millimeters of mercury. And this is a graph that shows you how the pressure goes down on top and how the medication changed over time. In red, you have the MP3, and in blue, the G-probe. At least you can see both procedures lowered the pressure, both procedures reduced medication at the beginning. I used a protocol with 80 seconds in one hemicircumference, so pretty low treatment with the um, MP3. So the medications went up over time and you have to retreat your patients. But we know this from the GPRO procedure as well. Usually you need one procedure, in a couple of eyes you need two, and in a very few amount of patients you need three procedures. And it's the same with the MP3. Sometimes you have to retreat your patients. But very impressive for me was how fast the pressure goes down. Some patients after one day you have a reduction, in most patients after one week you already have a reduction, and at the one month's time point, there's a huge difference here. With the G-probe it was going up because there was still some inflammation involved. With the MP3 the pr pressure was already far down. So from this first cases we saw, um, could show that both procedures could lower the medications anti-glaucoma drugs and lower the pressure simultaneously. MP3 was non-inferior and that was very important for me and then I started to use it widely on my patients. And we analyze more data now and we will come out with this. But let me show you a couple of cases just to present you when I want to use MP3 and what my patients are that I use MP3 on. This is an 87 year old Caucasian male. He was pseudophagic, he had pseudoexfoliative glaucoma, it was progressive and it was advanced visual field defects. I was having him for years and I come back later to the story, but he was on maximum topical treatment and he also had for a long time some Diamox pills. We did a diurnal pressure curve and the pressure over the time was around 23, it was progressive and it was definitely too high, so we had to do something. This is this visual field and it's, I mean, as you could see, there's a lot of damage already. So I was sitting down with the patient discussing treatment option. My first choice was be trabeculectomy. I mean, it's advanced little field defects, it's progressing, and the pressure is way too high. Or a glaucoma drainage implant. Well, we in Europe usually do trabeculectomy first, so that would be my first choice. Laser trabeculoplasty, I don't feel really good with this patient because there's too much defect and the pressure is too high. A G-probe would be an option. But on the other hand, I mean, we don't have a problem with the inflow, we have a problem with the outflow. So it's kind of not the physiological approach. But on the other hand, for years, and that's why the patient was already for a long time on Diamox, he 
didn't want to have any incisional surgery. So the vecalectomy and glaucoma drainage implants were not an option. So as a consensus procedure, we decided to do an MP3 on this eye. And as you can see here, three months after the MP3, the pressure went down to about 15. So in this case, the indication for the MPC procedure was the patient refused to undergo incisional surgery and he needed something to lower the pressure. Another case is an 86-year-old Caucasian female. She had a retinal vein occlusion. Three months later, pressure went up. She was on maximum medication, topical and also um, systemical with Diamox. Well, my retina colleagues took care about the retina, but the pressure was still elevated. After Avastin, it was going down in the 30s, but it was still too high. And she had a rubiosis. So in May and in um, June this year, we did two MP3 procedures on her eye. The pressure finally went down. I mean, it's not only the MP3 in this case. But these are cases we don't want to treat. We always run into um, problems with neovascular glaucoma. G-probe is an option, but MP3, as you can see, is also an option. The last case I want to present you is an 85-year-old Caucasian female, also pseudophagic. She was stable on her medication. She had moderate damage, prostaglandin, beta blocker, alpha-2 agonist, and um, topical calcium inhibitors. Her pressure profile with a mean pressure of about 18 and a range from 14 to 25 over the diurnal time. These are her um, OCT and you can see there is definitely some damage, but it's not that far advanced. So why do something? Well, over the time she was developing topical irritation and conjunctival hyperemia due to her drops. So she was not tolerating her treatment anymore. We did an MP3 procedure and we got her off the prostaglandin and the alpha-2 agonist, which probably causes most of the um, irritation, hyperemia, and the discomfort to her. The pressure was still controlled, and this for six months now. So in this case, the indication was glaucoma controlled on medication, but intolerance to medications. So you heard before, how does MP3 work? Well, we don't really know for sure yet. We have some ideas, but we cannot prove it now for sure. Well, MP3 is applied a little bit more to the tissue, more to the pars plana region compared to the G-Pro procedure. It is definitely not cyclodestructive. It probably increases outflow, while with the G-Pro, it's cyclodestructive and it decreases inflow. So even if it's still cyclophotocoagulation, these are two different procedures. And you've seen the video, and if you have some time, look it up on YouTube. It's really impressive what Murray Johnston was showing how MP3 is really working on the primary tissue. So in conclusion, the MP3 cyclo G6 procedure reduces IOP and medication. We do not fully understand the mode of action yet. It causes less pain and inflammation compared to traditional G-Pro procedure. I always give my patients when they go home after the procedure a couple of painkillers home, like pills, Advil or so. And I asked all of them, have you taken them the next day when I see them? The G-Pro patients always needed the medication in the night. The MP3 patients usually don't need any medications at nighttime. They don't have pain. And if you see the eye the next day, it's quite white. There's not a lot of inflammation if you look at the slit lamp. Yeah, and as I said before, it's not cyclodestructive. So, and this is my opinion, what patient qualifies for MP3? And we can really talk about this later. And there are probably much more cases that would qualify. In general, I think any patient who does not qualify for incisional surgery. So you can do the best trabeculectomy on your patients, and sometimes if they don't use your drops in the follow-up period, the pressure will go down and their scarring and the trap will fail. Those patients, if you know that they have malcompliance, maybe they qualify for an MP3 procedure. Any patient, and that's the case I showed you before, which refuses to undergo incisional surgery. You can even use this on neovascular glaucoma. Sometimes we have patients with poor visual acuity, but they still have elevated pressure. <coughs> so you're scared over the long time that they maybe have corneal complications, corneal decompensation. Those patients always benefit from an MP3 procedure. Elderly patients would have a high perioperative anesthesia risk. You usually would do incisional surgery, but because of the risk, do something else, do MP3. And that's the last case I showed you, any patient which is on medication controlled 
and does not tolerate the medication anymore. So you want to get them off the drugs, but still want to have the pressure controlled. So this is my standard algorithm of treatment. First start with drops, maybe do SLT over time, and then at the end you have to do incisional surgery. This is a one-day post-op picture of a trabeculectomy, and you all know they don't look always that nice. So in between there is a treatment gap, and because the eyes after trap sometimes make problems, sometimes have complications, we try to wait a long time before we do incisional surgery, and that causes this treatment gap in between that we don't have something that we want to do. So the ideal treatment in the meantime for me would be a procedure that's effectively lowering the IOP. It enables us as a physicians to take control over the treatment compliance. So it doesn't mean that the patient has to take that drop, but the procedure will still work. The procedure should be repeatable, and that's very important. It leaves the future surgical options open, so it doesn't touch the conch. It should be well tolerated for the patient. And we as surgeons always forget this. The patient has a completely different point of view when it comes to what is a good procedure. They look for a procedure that is quickly done, a procedure that causes low downtown for them. They want to go back to their regular life, to their work life. They don't want to stay in the hospital. They don't want to stay home. They want to continue with what they have done before. They want to have a fast recovery. They look for an outpatient procedure. They look for no pain or less pain and for no negative effect on the visual acuity, and that's very important. So this treatment gap in the last years was filled with mix, but because MP3 is not cytodestructive, it maybe would fit in this treatment gap as well, and in my practice, it fits. So look at the pros and cons before we finish. MP3 is non-incisional. That's a big plus for the procedure. It's not cytodestructive, and that's a big plus for me. Minimal to no inflammation post-op, big plus for the patient, it's repeatable, it has significantly low downtime on the patient, important for the patient again, and no or nearly no pain. Well, there are some cons as well. We don't have long-term data yet. Yet we don't have a big randomized controlled study published, there's one ongoing. MP3's procedures must often be repeated, same as with the G probe. One procedure not always is enough. And also in other cases, maybe not be enough, but then you can move on to incisional surgery if needed. It is definitely difficult to achieve a pressure between uh, below 10, and you have to invest in the laser. And in some countries, it can be difficult to get reimbursed for the fiber, but that depends on your country and your setting with your healthcare providers. Thank you.